<clears throat> Last panel here on the second deck about dredge, material management. I want to introduce Don Tavolaro, who is the moderator for today. Thank you all so much for coming, and uh, we expect this to be a great conversation. So I'll pass it on to John. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we're here to talk about dredge material management, one of my favorite topics, and I'm sure one of yours. Um, what I'd like to do first is um, let me tell you how we're going to do this. I'm going to introduce the panel members. Um, then I'm going to say about five minutes, uh, talk about five minutes just to set the tone of um, um, the panel discussion. I'm going to let each one of the, the panelists uh, have a, a few minutes to state their opinions, their views. And um, uh, Chris, one of the MWA staffers, is going to be walking around handing out cards <clears throat> that if you want to ask questions, just write your questions down on the card. He'll collect them, and then we'll do a uh, you know, Q&A session after that. So um, first, let me introduce the panelists, and I'll go around the table this way. We have Scott Douglas, who is the dredging program manager for the New Jersey Department of Transportation Office of Maritime Resources. <clears throat> and he, does, um, he develops dredging policy for the state and provides input on regional dredging forums and, and, uh, and other types of things like that, and currently serves on the regional dredging team for both the New York, New Jersey Harbor, and the uh, Delaware River estuaries. Uh, next to him is Matt Masters, who's with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, manager of waterways planning and development within the Port Commerce Department. And he's responsible for planning, development, and implementation of capital programs uh, that relate to dredging and maintenance dredging of the berths that the Port Authority manages. And um, Matt's been with the Port Authority for about 18 years, but he also previously worked for the Army Corps of Engineers and US EPA, and we never let him forget that. <laughs> Across the table is uh, Jennifer Sampson, Dr. Jennifer Sampson, who earned her PhD in biological sciences from Rutgers in ecotoxicology. Um, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the National Marine Fisheries Service James J. Howard Marine Lab in Sandy Hook, and her current position is principal scientist of clean ocean action, uh, where she provides scientific expertise on a, a whole diversity of topics. <clears throat> And last but not least, we have Andrew Gen, who is Vice President for Port and Rail Development of the New York City Economic Development Corporation. And Andrew has led several important studies um, that have formed the basis for much of New York's working waterfront agenda for over the years. So as I said, we're here to talk about dredge material management. And as you, you heard, if you heard uh, Chris Ward downstairs you could, uh, earlier today, you'd, you know, he emphasized how important that is in uh, a port uh, such as ours, and any port it relies on dredging really to, for recreation, commerce, and transportation needs. But unfortunately, it's not a very sexy topic. You know, there are people like me and some of the panelists who spend a lot of time and energy worrying about dredge material and dredge material management, but um, nobody really thinks about it until it's a problem. It's kind of like, you know, snow removal or something like that, where nobody wants to know how it's done, just get it done. And when it doesn't get done, it's a crisis. So. Our job is to try and avoid some of these crises. Uh, unlike snow removal, um, it doesn't melt. Right? It's sediment. It's mud, sand, gravel, um, natural products that um, find a home in the navigation channels and need to uh, find a home outside the channels. It's really the sediment itself is not the problem. It's just in the wrong place. The sediment itself can be a resource. And this is part of dredge material management is uh, not to view it as a waste, but to try and view it a little bit more innovatively, to try and figure out a way that you can get it out of the channel and find another home for it uh, so that you increase the, um, the tools you have available to, to deal with the, the dredge material in the channel. Now, for the fa past 15 years, we've developed a system for dredge material management that was based on a couple of things that happened in the 1990s. First of all, the mud dump site which was the ocean disposal site for dredge material, most of the dredge material from this port was closed. <clears throat> and it was converted into the historic area remediation site, which is the, that area and the surrounding areas that needed to be covered with clean dredge material in order to remediate the site. Um, the other thing, big thing that happened during that, uh, that time frame was the New York and New Jersey Harbor Deepening Project was initiated. 
And that was the most aggressive of several um, previous deepenings. Um, generated a lot of material, a lot of clean material, and a, a wide variety of uh, types of material that had never been dredged before, like rock, sand, gravel, and uh, clay. So the, the paradigm that we developed was we had lots of clean material and we had lots of beneficial uses. Um, we built fishing reefs out of the rock, um, island restoration in Jamaica Bay with the sand, capping at the Haars. We also still had a smaller component that was too contaminated to um, go in the ocean or the wrong grain size to do some of these other beneficial things with. So we developed this um, dredge material processing uh, alternative which uh, mixed the material with uh, Portland cement and it was able to be used then in an upland setting for as landfill and brownfield cover to remediate those sites. And then we had something called the Newark Bay CDF, which, is an, which was an underwater pit that was created to handle a material that couldn't go anywhere else. So that's how we've been operating for the past 15 years. And it hasn't been without some issues. I mean, the cost of the non-HARS disposal options is, is kind of high. Uh, some of the smaller generators, like, the, like marinas and um, small boat yards and such, you know, already feel in the economic pinch. They really can't afford to do some of these things. And even some of the large generators, like the federal government, um, have to make you know, value decisions on what gets dredged because you know, the money is not there. The price is, is very high. Um, <clears throat> but what's going to compound these issues in the near future is that that paradigm is about to change. It's not going to change tomorrow, but it's going to change probably in the next two to three years. Uh, what's going to happen in the, at the end of 2012 is the New York, New Jersey Harbor Deepening Project is going to end. Um, so what that means is that the large quantities of clean material will no longer be available. Now, once the deepening ends, that 25 or 26 miles of channel that didn't need to be maintained because it was being actively deepened is now going to have to be maintained. And that's going to increase the quantity of the fine-grained dredge material, the muds and, and uh, um, and clays, silt and clays that are a typical black sediment that you might see in the harbor, most of that is not going to be suitable for the hars. So we'll have large quantities of that. We'll also not have the Newark Bay CDF available any longer. That's about to close in the next year or so. So, <clears throat> so what that means is that the current system that we've been using for 15 years is not going to satisfy us into the future. So that's the bad news. The good news is it's not happening tomorrow. We have some time to plan for that. And um, we should start planning for that now. And that's why this workshop is timely. That's why a lot of the discussions about dredge material management that, uh, that I've had with people are very timely. Um, there's lots of groups aware of, aware of that paradigm shift, and they want to help. And it's a, it's a wide variety of people. It's not just port types, but it's also urban planning types, environmental groups. Um, all sorts of groups are aware of this, so that's, that's good. So what we need to do is work together and figure out what we're going to do to move into the future. So the new paradigm is going to be large quantities of, of you know, black mud, small quantities of clean material, and we're going to have to figure something else out. Now, it's, it's not like we don't know anything. You know, we, we know a lot about dredge material management, not just here, where we've done a lot of uh, work over the years, but also you know, nationwide, there's been a lot of work done. So what we need to do is uh, you know, come to some consensus as to what we should be doing for the future. And it's not going to be any one thing. You know, there's no magic bullet. There's no um, panacea. There's no single thing that's going to be, aha, we've solved the problem. What we're going to need is the right material in the right place, a whole variety of things. We need to look at all of the tools available in the toolbox to try and come up with um, uh, something that's going to work for this region. So. So I look forward to working with everybody to do that. And I look forward to what the panel members think about all of this. So with, without further ado, I'll turn it over to the first panel member, Scott. Actually, probably a little easier to do this standing up. So I can look both ways without straining my neck. Uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, I'm glad that you're uh, showing some interest in this uh, particular topic, which is near and dear to my heart. I've been working on dredge material management my entire uh, professional career. So that spans the uh, length of time from the very first dredging crisis in New York Harbor back in the very early 90s uh, to today, where John is, uh, seems to say that we are about to 
enter into another crisis, and I would agree. But there's a couple of things that we need to realize are very different today than they were back then. Back then, we found ourselves in the middle of a crisis. We really weren't aware of it until it hit us back in the face. Uh, we were, uh, had been moving along, uh, dredging and disposing of dredge material in the ocean without any fanfare and without any concern. And we're about to embark on a very large project to uh, deepen the harbor here. And um, all of a sudden, we couldn't do what we had always done. And we didn't have any tools in our toolbox. We didn't have any options. And we really didn't know a lot about the harbor mud out there. Uh, you would think being one of the most uh, famous and impressive harbors in the world that we would know a lot, but we didn't. That's not true today. There's a couple of things that are very different, and I encourage everybody to remember this. Number one, we are without a doubt the most successful harbor in the nation at managing dredge material beneficially. We have learned an enormous amount in the last decade and a half about how to do this and do this right. Okay? We also are not at a crisis yet. We are dredging. We are moving along. Our harbor deepening is on schedule to be completed within the next couple of years. Right, Matt? So we have done it. Okay? What we are seeing is that we are, we are approaching a point in time where things are changing, as John said. Funding is going to change for deepening. We are going to, uh, rather than being the darling of Congress, uh, being the, uh, the host of the largest civil works project in the country, we're going to go back to just being another port competing for dredging dollars. The other thing we've noticed is that while we've been very successful at dredging the major shipping channels, we have not been very successful at keeping our working waterfront dredged. Uh, there are a lot of small quantity generators, a lot of small operations, particularly on the New York side, that have not been able to dredge for the last decade or even more. Uh, we just went past Union Dry Dock. Union Dry Dock is now at half capacity uh, for their graving docks because two of them were not dredged in time and they rotted in place. Uh, this is a serious issue. Uh, these small operations do not make a lot of money, and if we're going to keep our working waterfront, if we're going to have the character that we like to see, and, and if we're going to be able to support our ports, we're going to have to keep, we're going to have to do something different. Okay. Now, does that mean that we're going to go back to the way it was 20 years ago? <laughs> no, we're not. Uh, not even if Jennifer would let us. We're not going to do that. Uh, we wouldn't want to do that. We've learned a lot about, about sediment as a resource, as John said. There are a lot of options out there that we know a lot more about, a lot of things that work and a lot of things that don't work. We also have spent a lot of money studying this harbor system. We spent over $20 million evaluating the way toxins move through this system, which ones are in the sediments, which ones are of concern, where they came from, where they're going, how long they're going to be there. There are a lot of things that we know now we knew nothing about then. And we can use that information to make predictions, to go out and uh, look at, the, look at s what sediments might be suitable for what types of uses, um, to open up or widen uh, the uh, options that we have available to us. So I encourage us all to do that. And I would say that we are not in a position, this isn't just a glad handing either. I'm not just saying something that isn't already written down. We've, uh, some of the people that are at this table, uh, in fact, all of us at this table, uh, worked very hard a couple of years ago to develop a regional sediment management plan. And that plan, much like uh, you say I see Lisa Barron in the audience and her restoration plan for the harbor, the regional sediment management plan is a blueprint for how we might look to manage our sediment wisely in the future. It addresses things like dredge material management. It addresses things like cleaning up the harbor sediments. It addresses issues such as uh, land side use and how that affects the amount of sediment that we have to move but we haven't implemented this plan. It's been sitting on a shelf for the last three years. And the reason, it hasn't, the reason it has done that is because it hasn't had the political backing. There hasn't been a push to do it. And the reason, well, because we do things the same way in this harbor, uh, we haven't had a crisis yet. Um, what I encourage those of you who are in positions to make decisions is to uh, find out about the Regional Sediment Management Plan and work to implement it. There's a lot of good things to be done in there, but it does require some political support. So that's my, that's, that's my summary of where we are and, and the solutions, and I'm going to pass it on to, uh, to the next speaker. Matt, you want to say a few words? Thanks, Scott. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just give you a little perspective from the Port Authority's point of view. Uh, we're a significant dredger in the harbor, by all means not the only dredger. Uh, we dredge because we have to. We have <clears throat> uh, various marine terminals that we lease out, and our lease arrangements require us to provide 
depths that the tenants need so that they can provide the shipping lines with the depth of water at birth that they need. Probably in the last 15 years, the Port Authority averages about 100,000 yards of maintenance dredge material that is no longer suitable to go to the ocean. So <clears throat> we have, along with everybody else, um, all these panelists, all the other dredgers and needers in the harbor, um, have pr pretty much looked upland in, in, the, in the last decade plus. Um, and what I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about is what I would consider the next evolution of upland placement. It's not the only tool in the toolbox, as got to use your term there, Scott. Um, I think others are going to talk more about in-water placement opportunities. Uh, but I just want to give a couple minutes of perspective. We have focused on the ever-increasing cost of dredge material placement and, and disposal. And what we have done for the first time for this region, and what I mean by the next evolution of upland placement, is the dredgers had arrangements with placement sites. Um, as, a, as somebody needing those dredging services, we were never sure from a contract to contract basis where our material was going to end up. Some of the dredgers who had less robust contracts with entities that operated placement sites never really knew where their material was going to go on a contract to contract basis. And because of that, well, one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons that the price of upland placement of dredge material has, has uh, escalated in the uh, second half of uh, the 2005 through 11. Um, for the first time, uh, and, and we are, we are, what we average about is $100 a yard, or that's the number that's been used for the most part uh, by people quoting numbers to go upland. Um, we would like to knock that down, and we think we can knock that down for everybody in the harbor by about 30 percent as a start. And we have uh, entered into, for the first time, a long-term placement agreement with an entity in the region, in the port district. And that was one of our requirements with this entity, is that they be responsible and go under contract to take our material for a long period of time, more than a decade. What that did is it introduced certainty. They must and are re contractually required to have a site in the Port District, which we define as roughly 25 mile radius from the Statue of Liberty. They must have a placement site available to us for over the next decade. The certainty and again, we've talked to all the dredgers for years and years and years. They were never sure where that material was going to go. And because of that, all the dredgers added in a contingency into their bids on a $100 yard price that probably was 15% or equated to at least $15. That goes away. Because now everybody who's competitively bidding for a, dredge, for, for a Port Authority contract at least, and we think others will start to use our model, they will, bid, they will bid on dredging, processing, and delivering to this site that we will name in our contract. They no longer have to worry about finding the sites, making sure the site is approved for the material that they're going to dredge. And we believe that that certainty will, will do a great job of helping reduce the price. Secondly, what we required this entity to do was, for the first time ever in this harbor, as much of a waterfront as we like to say we have, is require that placement site to be have access by barge for dredge material. Every 3,000 yard dredge material scow of processed material equates to about 300 trucks on the road having to go out and back uh, just to service one, one scow one day's worth of processing. Um, by allowing the dredger to bring an entire scow load, um, he no longer has to worry about that transport of uh, trucking. He's not in the trucking business. He doesn't have to go into those contracts. He owns his scows. He owns his tugs. He dredges and he delivers it to the site. So just uh, w I, we do believe that uh, if with, with those two uh, aspects, the long-term certainty and barge delivery, the price is going to start to go down. We're getting away from farther and farther afield. And uh, we, we, well, we've seen evidence that it's already starting. Um, the only th other thing that uh, I wanted to say about that is we, the Port Authority, I mentioned, we, we dredge about 100,000 yards a year currently. 
This entity knows that they can't survive on the Port Authority's 100,000 yards. And so while we have locked them up and they have to provide us with capacity of 100,000 yards a year on average, they know they can't survive on that. So their prices are going to have to be good enough for other dredgers and other ne guys needing dredging to be able to come to them with the same price or very close to that price and provide that regional certainty to everybody else who needs to dredge in the harbor. So again, that, that's how we think we've taken upland placement, beneficiary using non hard dredge material to the next level and we hope to continue. Jennifer? As you heard, my name is Jennifer Sampson. I'm with Clean Ocean Action. And I think one thing that really says a lot about managing dredge material in the harbor is that there's an environmental group uh, actively on the panel. Um, and I think that lends, you know, I think it's what's been part of the success of the program for the last 10 to 15 years is that the people, everyone's at the table, you know, to, to come up with solutions that meet everyone's needs you know, that's acceptable to, to both the business communities, the environmental communities. And, you know, I think it's led to, I mean, what, when we look back on where we've come, you know, everyone's hearing upland. Well, what does upland mean? In this case, it means that the dredge material is coming out of our channels and going to sites along our waterfront that are contributing to water pollution through runoff and leaching that are eyesores and useless pieces of land in those communities. They're contaminated. They don't have any, any business or industry or activity on them. And we've taken a, a waste material as far as how it used to be treated. And we've turned that into a way to remediate land sites, clean up water pollution, and we've made a really big difference on the Jersey side and the New York side, closing landfills and turning brownfield sites into usable economic drivers that in themselves create um, money for those communities, jobs, opportunities. So, you know, when you look at it from, a, from one side and the dredging, you know, you see the benefits that it provides there with a placement for this material that before did not really have a home. And then the landward side and the economies that are, are gained from getting the dredge material. I think what we're learning is that although it's a great program, it needs to evolve for the next decade, the next two decades. And there's a lot of inefficiencies that I think have been identified, the problems that keep material from getting to a site that needs to be the problems with cost, the problems with timing and permitting, you know, and, and the Army Corps and the New Jersey DOT have, have done some great analyses, economic analyses on, you know, where are the problems, how can we, you know, what raises the price, things like cement and the price of cement, you know, I think though what I hear from New Jersey and New York and from the dredging community is this major disconnect between the dredging and the upland placement, whether it's timing, whether it's location, whether it's permitting. And, um, you know, I think that there are a lot of opportunities to clean up some inefficiencies and get the price back down, get the price down to where it's, it's economically sustainable the way that it is environmentally sustainable right now to use material upland. Um, the problem is the price has gotten to where it's less and less feasible. But, you know, I looked to a report that was done by the DOT on a public processing facility. You know, their numbers were for 2006 and with all the, you know, being extremely conservative, it was about $50 a cubic yard. So um, the numbers that are in the handout are 2007 at $100 a cubic yard. So, um, you know, and then the Army Corps looked at it and did their own analysis in 2007 about, you know, different funding scenarios, different public, private ways to look at it that brought the price down even more. And I think that there's efficiencies that weren't even recognized there. I mean, the original DOT study was building a facility from scratch on the harbor 
where you know maybe there's facilities around or in Staten Island where they're already you know they have a big um, project underway we've got some um, facilities in New Jersey that might be a good host for you know a complementary use of dredge material but I think what's exciting about the future is that we have a great environmentally sustainable solution with the upland use of, dr of processed dredge material and now we need to find a way to make that an economically sustainable use going forward. I think we've identified some ways to do that and now it's time to start implementing that as a group through policy, through um, planning and through implementation. Thank you, Jennifer. I really liked uh, John's analogy to snow removal because it really is, except that every day in the port it's snowing and just, you just don't see it with dredge material. We've been dredging New York Harbor, I guess the Army Corps in earnest since the 1880s and that's because the natural depth of uh, New York Harbor is about 20 feet and uh, I think a lot of you realize that 20 feet doesn't cut it if you're a post Panamax container ship that wants something like in the order of 50 feet. So, uh, but it's also true for the small terminals as well. And uh, when I first started at uh, EDC uh, in uh, the late 90s, um, it was very apparent to me that even though we had been working on all of these port strategies to, you know, uh, reactivate the port in Brooklyn and uh, to look at um, how we could uh, get even uh, the New York Container Terminal and Howland Hook on its feet, the first thing we realized is that we had to solve the dredging problems, especially on the New York side. At that time, there was a lot of leadership coming from the New Jersey side on dredging, and we were able to work very closely with New, York, with New Jersey to build an upland placement uh, program uh, on the New York side. But I got to tell you, you know, we haven't even begun to see what a real crisis is on dredging. I know we're talking about it, but for some of us oldsters, like uh, me and Scott and Matt, and Jennifer, I think it was even before your time, a crisis is uh, a thousand longshoremen facing off against a thousand environmentalists at Fort Monmouth in 1999. And I, uh, we, I had the, uh, the misfortune of being uh, the person to put together the talking points for my boss at the time, Seth Kay, um, who basically shut down the meeting when he pretty much loudly said, we need to keep the harbor working at all costs. And then the longshoremen went crazy, then the environmentalists went crazy, and uh, pretty soon they were, uh, the police had to be called in at Fort Monmouth. So at that point, we realized we had to do something in New York because uh, it wasn't going to be sustainable. This was, the whole issue was over a small um, uh, oil terminal up in Queens that uh, couldn't, that, that was uh, approved to go to the HARS for uh, placement of its dredge material and uh, groups like Clean Ocean Action felt that that material really wasn't clean enough to go into the ocean. And I think what we did was take it to heart and we did with the help of Empire State Development Corporation uh, and, the, and New York State DEC, we put together a pilot project for upland placement uh, in, uh, in Brooklyn. And basically what, what we did was take some great ideas that uh, Scott and Lisa and the team in New Jersey had and we just proved to ourselves that we could do what they did in New Jersey which was mix the uh, dredge sediments with Portland cement and put them up on a landfill. And uh, it worked very well first in Brooklyn and then uh, we were able to do the same thing uh, of, over at Fresh Kills in Staten Island. Uh, and now we're doing it at Brookfield Landfill, uh, which is adjacent to Fresh Kills. And hopefully, I, I believe, Matt, we, I, I, in some way we paved the way for uh, the uh, property in Staten Island that you've been working on. But um, this is all fine for the large projects. And this is where Scott and I, I think, are really um, working very closely together to say that the cost of dredging, you know, at say $100 a cubic yard is affordable for large uh, entities and for public entities, but it uh, is really not a price point that all of the smaller maritime businesses um, in the harbor really can pay. Um, and the problem begins at the beginning. A lot of companies, small companies, marina operators, uh, tugboat operators, and shipyards 
can't even afford to test their material right off the bat because it's so expensive to perform what we call a bioassay, which is when you, de you determine whether or not it's safe enough to place material in the ocean at the HARS site. Uh, even a bulk chemistry test just to see what kind of chemicals are present um, can be a hardship to a small marine terminal. Uh, and what happens is that these companies just defer dredging. Uh, they will uh, do their best to light load um, their barges if it's a petroleum terminal or an aggregate terminal. Uh, if it's a marina, they'll try to get a permit to lengthen their dock closer to the federal channel to where the deep water is. And then at a certain point, like in the case of a union dry dock and several companies like May Shipyard or in Staten Island, they just give up and they sell out. And if we're talking about, you know, a, a comprehensive waterfront plan for New York Harbor, it has to have a cost-effective mechanism for dredging, both for large and small projects. Now, um, one thing that we're looking at quite in earnest, and my colleague Katie Axt uh, at ADC is uh, really leading the research effort, is looking at what other ports do. How do we reduce the cost? How do we, um, and, it's, and, I, and I agree with what Jennifer said, there's a public component to this, whether it's a sort of an indirect subsidy, um, but it goes to the widest uh, collector, the widest users as possible. Um, we're looking at things like a federal facility, which is what a lot of ports in the United States have. And um, uh, in particular, uh, places like Boston that uh, have um, used um, sub-channel cells in in-water placement safely for their dredge material. Um, that's something that uh, I think uh, has a lot of potential. The other thing that we need for all of this is money. And uh, now everyone, everyone who wants to write a letter, what we want to do is, um, is talk about the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund, which is a fund that is maintained by the federal government. It's paid through user fees. And it actually has a surplus of about $7 billion. And you know what that fund is supposed to be used for? For dredging and ma maintenance dredging. And a lot of ports in the United States are banding together to demand that that fund be opened up so that we, uh, as, as a nation, can uh, address the problem of the cost of, uh, of dredging, keeping navigable waterways clear. So uh, just a few ideas. And uh, I think it's something we're excited to work on with Colonel Boulay. Uh, and the entire regional dredge team uh, uh, to, uh, you know, to have a strategic plan for dredge material management in New York Harbor. Um, and that's my, uh, my talk and uh, open for questions, John. Yeah, thank you. Well, first, let's uh, have a round of applause for all our speakers. Yeah, and... Um, yeah, please write questions down on your card. Chris here from Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance is handing them out. And don't be bashful. Ask away. Um, well, what you heard from the speakers, just if I can summarize a little bit, um, you heard a discussion of dredge material management in the context of, of something larger, regional sediment management. Uh, you heard about you know, what we, some of the things we do, we can still do. We just have to tweak what we do, maybe look at what other ports are doing. Um, we heard about economies of scale, like the Port Authority is, is working on um, a federal facility, some sort of leadership um, role for um, one or more entities to, again, come up with those economies of scale, which might affect the price. And you heard a lot about price. Um, you know, we already have a, a, a problem with price for the small generators. And as, as a large generator, I guess I'd call myself, um, you know, we, we don't have the, the, the money to um, dredge, meet all the needs of dredging into the future at the pri prices we're currently uh, paying. We heard about the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund. Well, maybe there's a source for some of those funds if it gets freed up. And I think the bottom line is that we're all talking about these things, which I think is a good thing, because we're going to have to plan if we're going to avoid a crisis in the future. And as long as we continue to work together, I'm confident that we will. Um, Okay, so the first question is, do you support the current New York Assembly bill, which would reclassify certain dredge sediment as beneficial use materials, and if not, why? Any takers? 
I think uh, it would help if we have a reclassification so that both states, New York and New Jersey, are on the same page as it, uh, as it pertains to dredge material classification. I think that it's, there is a certain onus in New York um, or a, uh, a burden of proof because if you start off classifying it as a solid waste, then uh, it's, it's difficult then to argue at a public meeting or in a forum that this material actually has a, a potential for beneficial use. So I would say, uh, but I, I am, uh, you know, full disclosure, a, a public nonprofit corporation and we do not lobby, but uh, if we were informing people, we would say it's probably a good idea to be on the same page on a lot of things so that we have one unified front with uh, both states. Just to add on to that, that's something that, although we haven't uh, gone to speak in front of various forums to talk about this issue, I will say, um, you know, and how New York handles this is New York's business. But in New Jersey, very early on in the, um, in the, the new age of, of dredge material management, we realized that having dredge material classified as a recyclable product uh, and excluding it from the solid waste rules was, made it much easier to develop a regulatory program that was tailor-made. So it wasn't about trying to relax the uh, regulatory oversight on dredge material management. It was the opposite. It was to remove the restrictions that were inappropriate and to make sure that we had the proper restrictions and controls that were appropriate. So it's about developing a regulatory program uh, that is for the matrix that you're interested in regulating. Yeah, I'd just like to add that uh, this morning we heard a lot about uh, needing to streamline permitting and the regulatory hurdles. Um, this would go a long way towards that. Back in 2003, to that end, we did get the two states to agree to one joint sampling and testing plan for dredge material. That was a big step. For the first time ever, we could go to either side of the regulatory uh, at the state level and ask for a sampling plan, d depending on what uh, what state the, our facility uh, resided in. And we knew that the criteria and the sample plan we got from that state was reciprocal and okay with the other state. That was huge. So this would go hand in hand with that and take away one more hurdle. So I, I would be wholeheartedly for it. And I guess the only clarification we'd have, we actually spoke at the um, New York City um, Council meeting on that. and. Um, I think just the one missing piece that still has to be in place in New York is the regulatory scheme that's specific to dredge material that New Jersey put in place prior to um, declassifying it. So I think exactly what Scott's saying, dredge material is not solid waste and needs its own set of, of specific material relevant regulations and, um, and that would in turn streamline the uses and increase beneficial opportunities. Okay. Uh, the next question we have is, uh, do you think sediment decontamination technologies are viable for large-scale deployment? Is Eric in the room? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, le let me answer that by not, I don't want to, sediment decontamination technologies are one tool in the toolbox, and it's an extremely technical area. Uh, that could be, we could spend hours and hours talking about, about it and probably most of you would just glaze over with it. Um, suffice it to say that sediment decontamination is an engineering solution for how to manage dredge material. Uh, I prefer to look at it as environmental manufacturing. It's taking the product and making, or taking dredge material and running it through a, pro a manufacturing process that in addition to decontaminating it creates something that has value. Um, I would say, rather than saying that th is that possible in this harbor today, um, I'd rather say that it is part of a process that we need to undergo. What we need to do right now is we need to get all of our tools out of our toolbox, all of the different options that are being used across the country and across the world, and reevaluate it against what we've learned about the, the dredge material that we need to manage, the quantities and the characteristics of that material, which we now know. So if we take, the, take a look at the um, take a look at all of the options and all of the vulnerabilities, all of the information that we have now, and, uh, and, and reevaluate what works where. What, what bin can we place the various classes of material into and come up with a solution that makes both economic 
and environmental sense. That's what we have to do. It might be a little painful. Uh, we went through this once before. Um, but I think that we can go at it now with a much better understanding of where we're at and hopefully, you know, come to a good, both scientifically supportable and politically supportable solution. I would just add also, Scott, that you also have to look at, you know, how much energy is involved, how much to transform essentially mud with some contaminants into something that it isn't, you know, to make a chemical change. There's a lot of energy involved, and that's a cost too, you know. And what we found is that doing less with the mud, <laughs> with the dredge, is generally more cost effective than doing more, you know, heating it up to extreme levels or, you know, adding, uh, you know, more processing to it is, uh, is, is only going to, uh, you know, I think further increase the cost. But if we can prove otherwise, we're certainly open to that. Yeah, it, it just, just um, add, for navigational dredge material, I think less is more because we're dealing with a fairly low economic threshold. When you're talking about remediating contaminated sediments in the harbor that are a source to, of contamination to the rest of our system and to make our, our, the economics of our navig maintaining our navigation system more burdensome, then I think that you might want to look at something a little higher tech. But remember, the more energy you put in, the more valuable the product you get at the other end. So it, it does, and, and there are some possibilities for energy recovery. Like I said, it's very technically uh, interesting. Yeah, I'll add some to my two cents. Just what Scott mentioned is very important, that there is a difference between what you do with, you know, sort of routine dredge material and, and sediments that are a source of pollution um, in a significant way to the dredge material and to the environment. So, and from what I've seen over the years, you know, any kind of decontamination or processing of dredge sediment needs to be offset by having a product that's valuable at the other end. That if you don't have something you can sell, let's say, or has a value to it, the costs are, are very high. So, um, <clears throat> all right, here's a question that kind of goes to assistance, I guess, for for um, um, small users, you know, uh, small generators. The question was about nonprofits have adopted historic ships, which are extremely expensive to save. Will the government support dredging for designated historic ship piers, especially in the North River? Yes, no. Um, <clears throat> this, this, well, the way I would look at this is, is um, it's part of the problem that we, we were all talking about earlier, which is that small generators can't afford to dredge. So I'll turn it over to whoever wants to address that. I think one thing we have to start with is, uh, and you probably appreciate this, John, is that federal government's responsibility generally ends at the federal channel line and uh, everything else is usually on a locality or a state. So probably the, the, um, uh, the cost to dredge uh, for historic vessels would fall to, to the city or to the state of New York. And I think uh, we, would, uh, we would certainly, you know, in this effort to reduce the cost of dredging, I think that's the first, the first piece is to try to come up with strategies so that we know the dredging cost is as low as it possibly can be, which means that there's lots of placement uh, capability and uh, the cost to process uh, and dredge has been minimized. Um, and I think that gets to sort of the heart of this panel is how do, we, how do we get to that level so that it is just normal again in New York Harbor. Dredging for small quantity generators is not normal right now and we, um, that's our challenge. So. And yes, we'll tell if you have a specific proposal, send us a letter. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to face them all. No, no. no. Um, you know, I think that uh, an important part of kind of making the small quantity generators, you know, be able to afford it is, you know, some idea of, of a public private um, relationship where, you know, one of the things that was discussed in the Army Corps evaluation of a, of a processing facility was, you know, to have a tiered tipping fee for, you know, depending on who the users were, to help bring prices down for, you know, the person, the group that's bringing in a thousand cubic yards versus the one that's bringing in a hundred thousand cubic yards, you know, and, and, you know, there's a lot of economics that needs to be discussed on, you know, what a facility like that looks like, but um, by having these partnerships and finding these efficiencies, it, it opens up opportunities to have a tiered pricing structure, you know, and let them in on this game that, 
you know, has gotten to be a rich man's game, it looks like. Yeah, uh, just because um, it's $100 a yard, $60, $70 a yard, doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt entities like the Port Authority to spend that kind of money. We have had a zero increase in our operating budget for the last three years running. So every year we have to do, with, with the cost of business going up every year, we have to do less with the same amount of money. So. We used to dredge a lot more than 100,000 cubic yards a year, and w we've cut way back. Uh, we've cut many other programs back. So I don't want anybody in this room to think that just because we have to dredge and we do dredge that 100,000 yards that it isn't putting severe economic constraints on entities like the Port Authority. No, and I think that that, that brings down uh, one, of the, one of the items I had written down in my notes to make sure to cover is consequences. And I think that, that we sort of alluded to it, but we haven't really laid it out. Um, dredge material management is really a public issue. I mean, it is a community issue that we have here in this harbor, and we have economic benefits that we all garner. Uh, it's a 30 to $40 billion, depending on whose numbers you use, uh, of economic activity generated by this harbor, and that's the entire harbor, not just Matt's terminals. Um, but it's, we, we, need to balance the cost of maintaining that system, that transportation system, against what happens if we close down parts of it. Uh, some of my colleagues who work on highways have uh, learned that uh, there are severe financial consequences to not maintaining a transportation network. Uh, if you put off maintenance long enough, you lose it completely. And then it costs you a whole lot more to put it back. So I think we need to, as we talk about options, we, re we, we go through this painful process of reevaluating where we are um, and, and, and trying to negotiate solutions, whether they be um, you know, beneficial use options upland, beneficial use options for restoration in the water, or, uh, or, or some sort of combination of the two, uh, we're going to have to look at what the consequences of not doing that are. Uh, and it may come to the point that administratively or as a community that we're going to have to support financially the, the maintenance of this system. Um, it's not just going to be the Army Corps, the federal government, it's also going to be the state and local governments doing that. So, um, uh, it also points to, the f to, to what, to, to your, I don't know if you were going to talk about the, the value of cleaning up the harbor? Good. Why don't you do that? <laughs> well, 